Welcome to the Art Garden at the Israel Museum, the Billy Rose Art Garden. We're celebrating uh, the 55th anniversary of the Israel Museum with this uh, short tour that I'm taking you through some of the lesser known sculptures in the Art Garden. I want to begin by, view, by looking to the north and you can see the black wall and a sliver of the Shrine of the Book, a white sliver of the Shrine of the Book behind us. Uh, these are probably the most famous uh, monuments at the Israel Museum. But uh, today I want to focus on something rather different and it's this black sculpture by Jean Tingli, uh, uh, a sculptor from, of a Swiss origin. And Tingli was fascinated by mechanical movement. And rather than being fascinated by mechanical movement as uh, you would see engineers or technicians fascinated by mechanical movement, Tingli was fascinating by the way mechanical movement uh, uh, is in a sense poetic, in the way it uh, mimics or mocks our own movements. And he built many, many, many different sculptures uh, with mechanical movements. Some of them were self-destructive. Some of them did funny things like uh, putting uh, jam on pieces of toast and throwing them uh, in a big pile. Uh, and we are lucky to have this wonderful uh, Tingli uh, sculpture in our, in our garden. Uh, Tingli, by the way, was the, uh, was the partner of Niki de Sanfal, a very well-known uh, sculptor on our, in our own right. And Niki de Sanfal uh, created for Jerusalem uh, the golem, uh, the monster in Kriyat Yovel, in one of the um, western neighborhoods of Jerusalem. And Jerusalemites know that sculpture very well. And they also collaborated and did a lot of projects together, including uh, a very beautiful fountain pool uh, right in front of the um, uh, Pompidou Center in Paris, which some of you may know. Um, I want you to have a look at the sculpture and see, uh, and see its movement. Now I want to take you with me and show you uh, a few more, a few more uh, sculptures on the way. And we're going to look at a very important sculpture, which I like very much, which is completely different than Tigli's mechanical sculpture, kinetic sculpture. On our way, we can see to the right uh, Robert Indiana's uh, Hebrew version of the love sculpture, uh, very well recognized as part of our sculpture garden, and also this beautiful concrete sculpture by Picasso. Uh, it was built here in 1967 during the Six Day War. And um, I don't know if you know, but the, the sketches that Picasso did for sculptures such as this were usually from a, a piece of uh, discarded uh, cardboard that he found uh, in his uh, studio. Uh, in this case, it was a, a flattened out uh, packet of cigarettes. And with a pair of scissors, he snip snip uh, the silhouette of uh, one of his lovers. Come, I want to show you the next sculpture. And as we're approaching the sculpture, you can see it's a, it's a concrete block with a uh, a glass surface on top. It looks rather strange in the setting of a sculpture garden. But if we look inside, we can see something very interesting. We see a beautiful square of light, a rectangle of light, and we see ourselves reflected inside this room. And there's a white room inside with a dark corridor leading from the south into the room. And this sculpture, uh, called Equinox, um, is a sculpture that exists not on its own, but as part of the world, as part of a cosmic uh, um, setup. And it invites us to consider our life here on Earth as part of something much greater. And the beautiful thing about the sculpture is that the, 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 the rectangle of light moves or apparently moves through the sculpture during the day, but also through the yearly cycle. And uh, twice a year, on the day of the equinox, the day where the, the day and night are of equal length, uh, the square of light finds itself on the wall, on the northern wall, directly opposite the, the dark uh, entrance to the corridor leading to this room, this underground room. And in that day, the light and the darkness are in a sense uh, balanced. Uh, and if we look to the north, just from where I'm sitting, here, have a look. We look to the north, we see the black wall and the sliver of, of the Shrine of the Book between the trees, the white uh, uh, cap of the Shrine of the Book. And they too uh, uh, deal with this question of light and darkness. 
and they also deal with the children of light, light and darkness that appear in our Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's a beautiful connection, uh, an echoing, if you like, between this sculpture here, this underground sculpture that deals with darkness and light, and <clears throat> the Shrine of the Book, uh, designed by architect uh, Kiesler and Bartos, and of course our, our wonderful treasures of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Come, I want to show you some more. And as we walk along, we can see to the west uh, Henry Moore's vertebrae, a beautiful bronze sculpture, also here from the, right from the beginning of the um, uh, art garden. Uh, and it gives a, a very beautiful, uh, the, the city of Jerusalem. At that time, these hills were empty, they were barren, but now the city has moved to the west, has grown to the west, and there's a beautiful backdrop of the new part of Jerusalem uh, behind this beautiful sculpture. If we look forward, we can see <clears throat> the Anish Kapoor sculpture, very, very well known in our museum. But today, as I mentioned, I want to show you some of the lesser uh, known or, or, or less famous sculptures uh, of our garden. And as we are approaching, you can see uh, this is Michael Gross's Queen, uh, a very, I'd say, modest sculpture, very minimalist. I want to first go to the, to the back side of the sculpture and have a look at it from behind. As we can see, it's a very simple red tube. Uh, from this point of view, we, see, we can see a very, very, very slight uh, touch to its right side and a little bit of a corner taken out of its left-hand side. And as we move back to the front of the sculpture, we can now sort of revisit the gesture, the, 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 the sculpture's gesture. Uh, and this very simple red tube now uh, is, is uh, reframed or, uh, or receives its new meaning by the actual cutting out of the material from this red tube. And what I particularly like about it is, is it that its name, Queen, suggests that what we're seeing is a movement of a queen, or maybe the gown, the queen's gown, uh, maybe a, a corner of her crown, something uh, uh, that comes from this idea, this very, very abstract idea of what it means to become a queen. And this sculpture actually has a twin sculpture called Crown and Gown, which sits in Tel Aviv, in the Pinka Street in Tel Aviv. And uh, it seems like they have a dialogue between Jerusalem and, uh, and Tel Aviv, between these two sisters, if you like. Also, something that I always think about when I look at this sculpture is how it seems a little bit like a, 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 a queen from a chess set. This need to do a, a very minimalist sculptural move, gesture, in order to give a, a, a small piece of material its meaning as part of a, of a chess game. Let's continue. I want to now take you at the... Uh, we're, we're nearing the end of our, our tour and I want to take you to um, a sculpture which is also part of the garden. Um, it is uh, the source of the water, or the water source, by Isamu Noguchi. Isamu Noguchi, the, the uh, Japanese-American um, uh, landscape architect and sculptor, who was invited here in the early 60s by Billy Rose, uh, the empresario, the person who who so generously gifted this garden to the Israel Museum uh, to design an art garden. Uh, Noguchi uh, uh, worked on this garden under the impression that it's going to be uh, his cultural work without any um, partners, without any collaborators. He didn't uh, envisage it as a, as a garden that would have um, other sculptures by other artists in it. And when that fact was um, disclosed to him, there was a bit of a crisis. Fortunately, uh, he was pacified in time, and we are uh, forever grateful for the last 55 years to be able to enjoy Noguchi's creation, as well as enjoy all the other beautiful sculptures in the garden, a lot of them from Billy Rose's original collection. I want to end our tour today with a short story. It's a very beautiful uh, story in my mind. It's, it's a story from this place, uh, really where we're standing. And the story tells about Noguchi coming here uh, on, a, on a cold February afternoon with Ralph Goldman and Carl Katz and, and uh, um, maybe one or, or two more people from the, from the fathers of the, 
uh, of the Israel Museum. And he brings the, the plans, the, the blueprints that he made for the, for the new garden. And the blueprints have, a, have a, this idea that he had that he would build these archaeological ruins because the museum, as you know, is also an archaeological museum. Uh, and he comes here, he spreads out the plans, and he, he looks to the west with these people, and, um, and there's a long silence and they don't understand what's going on. And um, after what could be many, many seconds or maybe a couple of minutes, he does this. He tears these plans, he tears them into pieces and pulls them, uh, throws them up in the air and the cold wind sweeps them away and the people are shocked. And they say, what, what have you done? Why have you done this? And he says, it's all wrong. I had it all wrong. I was sitting there in my studio uh, in, in the United States and I didn't understand this place. I now understand this place. Of course, the hill didn't look like this. It was barren. The hills to the west were barren. There was just the beginning of the buildings of the Hebrew University. But he understood something about the, I'd say the DNA or, or the spirit of this place that he wanted to put into his work in a different way. And he went back to the United States and after a few months came back with new plants which are what we see now, these five beautiful crescent-like terraces that are a fantastic mixture of Japanese design, uh, Japanese landscape architecture, and the local terraces of the Judean hills. And I think this story is a wonderful story to tell at any time, but especially beautiful these days when we need to, to look at the plans we made and uh, our, the, the vectors of our ideas, the, 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 the ways we wanted to move forward and say, wait a minute, maybe we need to change a little bit, uh, maybe we need to reconsider because the time and the place may be slightly different than we imagined it. And I think it's a nice uh, story to go forward with as we redesign our lives to fit the current situation. I want to invite all of you uh, to come and visit us soon when we reopen. And also, if you like to ask me some questions, uh, here in the bottom of the page, you can write me questions and I'll be, I'll be happy to answer them. And of course, happy birthday to the uh, Israel Museum for its 55th anniversary. Thank you very much.